All right, now we're going to talk uh, the universe again and space and Jupiter. Excited for this. Dr Ian Griffin on the phone from Otago Museum. Hi, Ian. Kia ora, how are you doing? Kia ora, thanks very much for talking with us. Very well. Well, this is an exciting time because it's been, what, is it 57 years or something, or more like 59, that this planet's been so close to us? Yes, um, astronomers um, mm. all over the world are excited about us, Earth, being um, pretty close to Jupiter. In fact, the closest, as you said, for the last uh, nearly, nearly 60 years. Now, um, if your listeners are um, in the South Island tonight, it looks like it might be clear. So if you want to see Jupiter for yourself, um, basically it rises opposite the sky in the sun. So when the sun sets tonight in the west, turn your back to the sun, and as it gets dark, right. in the eastern sky you should see a really bright star uh, rising slowly. And um, that bright star is in fact the planet Jupiter. Um, and it's about as close as it gets to us, and that is 590 million kilometers. Uh, so it's still a pretty long way away, but um, it is incredibly bright, and it's bright firstly because it's relatively close to us, but secondly, Jupiter is always bright because it's the biggest planet in the solar system. Right. And it reflects sunlight really well. So um, you can certainly sit with your unaided eye, absolutely no trouble at all. But if you've got a pair of binoculars and you point them at Jupiter tonight, uh, you'll see the four bright um, stars mm. around uh, the brightest one. And they're its moons, its major moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Beautiful. And you can see those with binoculars. They're extraordinary things to watch. And they move so quickly around Jupiter that they change from one hour to the next. It's a, oh. a very pretty sight to watch. It would be. I've seen some lovely photographs because Jupiter is a beautiful planet, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you've got um, even a small telescope, so most people have got a telescope maybe they got for Christmas a few years back, get it out in the next few nights and point it at Jupiter because you can see so much um, Jupiter, if you look at it through a telescope, you can see its atmosphere and it has lines or bands called belts. And if you're really lucky, you'll see a great big red spot. And that's an enormous storm that's been raging on Jupiter for the best part of 400 years. It's called the red spot. And it, again, is just a fabulous thing to look at. So as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a mad keen astronomer and I love um, yeah. visually looking at Jupiter through telescopes. Um, but it is an awesome thing to see, and uh, it's really great. Uh, and tonight will be a good night to go out and look for it. It yeah. will be visible for the next few weeks as well, but, um, you know, it's always nice to see things when they're, they're closest and they're brightest. Absolutely. So I guess, so from now on, it's going to be moving further away again. That's right, um, because obviously the Earth goes around the sun um, once a year. It takes Jupiter about 11 years to go around the sun. So the Earth basically speeds past it. We're overtaking it. <laughs> yeah. And it will um, slowly go away. And then next year we'll come around again and it will get close again. Uh, but not quite as close. And, and the reason it's the closest for 60 years this year is because both Earth and Jupiter have got oval-shaped, or they're called elliptical, um, mathematicians would, would tell me, but they're oval-shaped orbits. And the ovals don't always align. And when they align, roughly every 60 years, you get these really close approaches of Jupiter. And that's why astronomers the world over are getting quite excited about it. Right. Now, it's got a special name, hasn't it, Ian? It's called Opposition. That's right. And it's called Opposition because Jupiter is opposite the sun in the sky. And that's why, you know, I said when you watch the sun go down tonight, turn your back to the sun. And as the sky darkens, you should very quickly see Jupiter very low in the eastern sky. In fact, tonight is a really good night to go stargazing because actually... Um, the moon is in the sky as well, and it's a very young crescent moon. My, my kids used to call it a smiling moon. Um, so as the sun goes down in the western sky, you'll see the moon, mm. uh, which will only be 6% illuminated, and it's only two days past new, so it will set very quickly after the sun sets. But try and spot it, because that would be a very beautiful sight. And you might see Earth shine, which is the, um, the, the darker side of the moon being illuminated by reflected Earth light. It's a very pretty sight, and you see it at this phase of the moon. How beautiful. I love the way that it's called opposition because it's nothing to do with politics. It's just, it's just a beautiful phenomenon that we can all enjoy, even if we don't have a telescope. But so do you think, do you think that, uh, what about folk in like, you know, cities and things? Obviously the sky is, is more polluted, you know, but, but say you're a sort of rural north of Auckland, would you still get a good view of this if, if it's clear? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it, Jupiter is so bright, you can see it from the middle of Auckland. There's no problem at all um, with seeing Jupiter. You'll have to wait until it gets a bit higher in the sky because the tall buildings get in the way. Mm. Um, but Jupiter is one of those things that even if you're in the most light polluted city in the world, like London or Shanghai or something like that, you can still see the brighter planets and, and Jupiter is 
literally almost as bright as it gets now. So um, it's a good time to go out and spot it if you do live in the cities. But those of you in the rural, um, those of us in the rural, I should say down here in Ottipotti, Dunedin, it's pretty uh, rural too. Yeah, right. Um, mm. If you get to a really dark spot, um, there are some people who say that you can see uh, it's bright enough to cast a shadow, which oh. would be an incredible thing. You'd only do that somewhere dark. So if you, if you, you know, face Jupiter and it's a really dark part of um, New Zealand, look behind you and see if your, your shadow is there. That would be an incredible photograph to get. If you can Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? There's a challenge, isn't it, <laughs> to listeners if they Absolutely. want to try that? Because, uh, you know, I think it's surprising how many New Zealanders are really fascinated by by our universe and... I guess it's because we're we're fortunate that we do have lots of dark sky spaces. Obviously, Tekapo being one of the the greatest places to look at the stars. I mean, it's it's breathtaking. Yeah, we're very lucky. I mean, as you can probably tell, I'm, I grew up in England. In fact, I grew up in South London. Mm. Um, I'm a Kiwi now. I'm proud to say. But um, you know, in South London, I was lucky if I saw the brightest stars. And when I moved to New Zealand, I mean, literally five ten minutes outside of Dunedin City, where I now live the sky is really dark and you can see the Milky Way. And, and, you know, I never really got to see that from the UK. Mm. So we are really lucky in this part of the world because we have access to these fantastic dark places. Um, and a lot of cities now are, are making it better for astronomy by putting in shielded streetlights. So, yeah. you know, we are working hard to protect this environment. And it is a talco that every, everybody in this country should really enjoy and, and benefit from. Mm. It's interesting because Jupiter is 591 million kilometres away and it's so funny what you say about, you know, how we overlap it <laughs> as, you know, in, in Earth. It's like you can imagine a racetrack with, with Earth overtaking Literally. Jupiter, you know. That's right. And the other thing I like to think about whenever I look up in the sky, you're looking back in time. So Jupiter is 591 million kilometres away, as you said. So the light that you see that's hitting your eyeball left Jupiter about 32 minutes ago. That's traveling at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers every second. So if you work out how many seconds there are in 32 minutes, that's a heck of a long way to, to Jupiter. That shows you how big our solar system is and how small we all are. So whenever I look up at the night sky, it really gives me a, you know, a sense of you know, how small and isolated I am and how big the universe is. And um, for me, that's one of the great unifying factors about astronomy. It does, I think, put us all in, give us a sense of proportion. Absolutely. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. Perspective. You know, um, there's a lot of mysticism about the universe, particularly in the olden days, because, well, I suppose people were afraid by things like meteors and what have you and thought, thought it brought bad tidings. But I wonder, Ian, have you heard of any kind of um, cosm cosmic sort of um, explanation, you know, like, you know, for things going a little bit weird when Jupiter is this close? Do, do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm just saying, like, would superstitious people say, oh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a sign? Or it's, um, you know, thing, uh, well, things could happen. <laughs> or is this just science? Well, uh, well I'm, a, I'm an astronomer, so I, I, I think, um, you know, there has to be a cause and an effect. Um, if you were speaking to an astrologer, um, which is a very different kind of pseudoscience, in my mind, That's they right. would say that the position of the planets do impact on you. But there's absolutely no evidence that that happens at all. No. Um, and, it, you know, Jupiter is, even though Jupiter is a big planet, its influence on the Earth is, is tiny. Its gravitational influence is, is minuscule. Okay. Um, so in that sense, you know, you're, you're right. People, if they see Jupiter and something bad happens, they'll say, ah, yes, I saw Jupiter. <laughs> it caused this bad thing. Yes. And it, that's not necessarily the way it works. Um, and um, basically, we, the motion of the planets around our solar system has been going on for millions, billions of years. Yes. And it's not really impacted the lives of people on Earth in, in any way at yes. all. Yes, it's interesting. It's just, and a lot of it, I think, dates back to the early religions. And, and I'm talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, where we didn't have the knowledge we have now. So knowledge is is a great thing because it's like it's like this meteor thing the other day when they when they were testing, you know, crashing into into it to 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 possibly help us in the future if something is 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 on a collision course with Earth. Like we can do these things these days because of science and because of the advancements that we see all around us, which has got to be a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. We pay respect. I mean, the ancient folks didn't have the tools that we now have to explain them the universe. And if you don't have those tools, you, you try and build models. And the models, you know, were based on, as you say, their religious beliefs or um, their mystic ideas about the way the cosmos worked. Uh, but now, you know, thanks to these incredible missions, like the DART mission that you refer to that crashed into the, um, the asteroid yesterday, mm. um, we've got phenomenal abilities as a, as, a, as a society to do these important things. As someone pointed out yesterday, we are the first inhabitants of this planet 
who have the ability now to protect ourselves from asteroids. Right. The dinosaurs couldn't do that, and they disappeared 65 million years ago because an enormous <laughs> comet crashed into the Earth. Yes, yes. So now, you know, thanks to yesterday's test, and that, for me, that was an amazing... I don't know if your listeners have saw the pictures yesterday, but NASA smashed this um, um, it, golf cart-sized space probe into an asteroid which is about 7 million kilometers away from Earth, and the asteroid was only about 130 meters across. So being able to hit a target that small from that kind of distance that accurately is just a phenomenal feat. And because we know there are potentially thousands of these asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit and might hit us, hopefully now we have the ability um, to maybe deflect them and make them miss the Earth. And that would protect us all from a pretty horrible fate because I don't want to be around the day a sort of a kilometre-sized asteroid hits mm. the Earth. That wouldn't be a good day for any, anybody. No, absolutely. And so we can be grateful and thankful for that we have this technology now to, to help us uh, possibly save the planet. The only thing we can't save it from is, uh, is warmongers and um, dreadful situations in Europe right now. But, well, that's true. You know, if, that's if, true, if, but I mean... You know, um, mm. Yeah, and the other thing that we must remember is, I mean, again, I would encourage folks who haven't seen the pictures from the DART mission yesterday, the pictures of the asteroid as the, as the, um, as the camera was getting closer and closer were just incredible. You can see in the final seconds these boulders that are only about five metres across. It really is an astonishing technical achievement, and um, hats off to all the, the NASA engineers and scientists who, who put that mission together. It's an incredible achievement, and um, yes. they all deserve a big pat on the back. Yes, 100%. I, th I think it's incredible. Who would have thought that we could do this? You know, <laughs> we, we're capable of doing this. Yes, and uh, of course, um, New Zealand's astronomers are going to be doing a, a fabulous job tracking the asteroid over the next few weeks to see exactly what the impact of that spaceship, um, what, what, how much impact it had on, on the orbit of that particular asteroid. Oh, very and, good. Um, so, so New Zealand astronomers based at the Mount John Observatory are going to be doing some observations of that particular asteroid and they'll really be contributing to this knowledge. So there's a Kiwi dimension to this, of course, as well, which is very exciting for, for astronomers like me. That is wonderful. Mount John is, is one of my favourite places in the whole country. It's great up there, isn't it? Absolutely. I think um, anybody who's not been um, and stood atop um, Mount John, in the, you know, overlooking the Mackenzie Basin mm. uh, on a clear night, you really need to. And actually, even a daytime visit when the sky is blue, mm. the, you're surrounded by these incredible mountains and um, Lake Tekapo and Lake Alexandrina. It's just a phenomenally beautiful place. So mm. we're, we're so blessed to have places like this in New Zealand. I feel that too, and, it, and it's open to the public, and you can even get a coffee up there, for goodness sakes. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think it's possibly the, the most beautiful coffee shop in the world. It's uh, got a stunning view. I agree. And in fact, you could almost feel like you were, you were standing on Jupiter up there, because it does feel very otherworldly, I think. It is. That's a very good, um, a very good analogy, actually, because um, the, the, the terrain from atop um, the viewing um, position is just extraordinary. It's, it's mm. dry, and then you've got these wonderful Alps um, around you with snow, snowy tops. Um, and as I say, the, one of the most astonishing things uh, I've ever seen was um, being on Mount John during a lunar eclipse when um, the full moon went blood red. Oh, wow. And the mountain went from being completely utterly, you could see, you know, very easily where you were standing. And it went pitch black. And it's so dark up there that you literally couldn't see your, your hand in front of your, your face. So that was an extraordinary, um, you talked about a mystical experience for me. Mm. You know, if I were an ancient and didn't understand that during the eclipse, uh, what was happening, I would have been really frightened by that. And think, oh my gosh, what's going on? What God, what God have I angered today? That's right. So, um, absolutely, that's, you know, you, as, as you started the, the interview by referring to, you know, there are lots of stories about space that were made up by, um, by our, our forebears. Mm, uh, yes, and, and it, is, it is so interesting. And, and it makes perfect sense that people were afraid because they didn't know, you just didn't have any idea what was happening. Tell me, when's, when's the next time that Jupiter will be this close? It won't be in our lifetime, will it, Ian? Um, it, well, I mean, roughly every 60 years it comes reasonably close. But um, to, to be completely honest, the, the difference in distance from one year to the next isn't huge. So next year it will come reasonably close again. Mm. And um, once every 13 months, Jupiter comes close to the Earth and okay. has this opposition effect. Um, but certainly um, the next few weeks and months are a really good time to get out there and take a look at Jupiter. Mm. And then, of course, later in the year, we've got Mars as well will be visible. Um, and early risers can see Venus in the morning sky as well. So there's always a, a few planets on view, and mm. uh, that keeps the sky entertaining. Mm. I think Jupiter looks so lovely with all, that, all those gorgeous colours of the cloud and, and the atmosphere. And, and you can see these in, in the photos. It's almost like a, a, a sort of a burgundy, sort of whiny rock colour, isn't it? That's right. And those colours are made by the, um, the chemicals in the atmosphere. 
Um, Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It's about 11 times bigger than the Earth, if you can imagine that. Um, and that's about, um, if I get my numbers right, 318 times more massive than the Earth. So it's a really big planet uh, with a really thick atmosphere. And it spins very quickly. So a day on Jupiter is less than 10 hours long. Right. So if you look at Jupiter through a telescope, you can see the cloud belts changing over the course of an hour or two. And it's a really fascinating thing to watch. And I think, um, you know, those, if your listeners do have access to a telescope, it's certainly worth taking a look through it because mm. Jupiter is a world that really does repay really careful observation. There's so much you can see. And if you haven't got a telescope, um, there's even a spacecraft called Juno, which is flying around Jupiter at the moment, taking incredible close-ups. And I'm sure some of the pictures you've seen were taken by the Juno, the cameras on board this Juno, uh, which is orbiting Jupiter and studying it scientifically. Yes. Um, so it is, I mean, um, astronomy is one of those subjects that you can really, you know, get a passion for. And uh, certainly I remember my first view, I, my, my favorite planet is probably Saturn. Um, and I remember my first view through Saturn when I was about four or uh, first view of Saturn through a telescope when I was about four or five years old. It was just incredible. And it doesn't look real because you've got this little tiny disk surrounded by these beautiful rings. Um, Saturn's also on, visible, uh, also on show in the sky at the moment. It's slightly higher up in the sky than Jupiter. Uh, so, as I say, we're quite privileged at the moment to have, I think, about three planets visible easily in the, uh, in the evening sky. And it's well worth listeners, I think, taking a chart, taking a few moments out to enjoy the view. Mm, fantastic. When, when, you know, this evening, for example, uh, when, when would you recommend, you know, like a specific well, time or? Yeah, well, if you want to see Jupiter rise, mm -hmm. it's around just after sunset. Look, um, but Jupiter will be very low in the eastern sky. Jupiter is highest in the sky at about 1.30 in the morning. So oh. that might be a bit of a late <laughs> night. Yeah. But um, it's high in the northern sky. And it's mm. about 45 degrees above the horizon, so it's pretty high. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, if you really want to look through a telescope, that will be the best time to look at it. Right. But certainly from about sort of, um, I guess, nine, ten o'clock onwards, uh -huh. um, just when it's getting dark, you'll see Jupiter in the eastern sky slowly ascending as the Earth rotates and brings the planet higher in the sky. Gorgeous. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Well, hopefully we all uh, get a chance to, um, to have some free time tonight and look skyward and see, see what we can see. Be great. Absolutely, absolutely. And remember, it's all free as well. You don't have to pay for this show. It's quite a nice one. <laughs> That's right. Don't have to go to the movies tonight, folks, or, or whatever. No, the, the, oh, nature is, is a wondrous thing, and Jupiter, I think, is very, it's just a very intriguing planet. Yes, absolutely. It is, um, as I say, all of the planets are interesting in different ways. But if you, um, if you, if you are an astronomer, Jupiter is a planet that changes so much over the course of the night that it's really interesting to watch. So mm -hmm. much in astronomy... It was there for a long time, but you can see the dynamic and the, and the motions in the in the planet's atmosphere, and it's a really interesting thing to observe. Mm. Well, and um, you don't say so you don't need a, a, a very powerful camera to do it; you just need a telescope and you'll mark one eyeball, and you can see it for yourself. Terrific. Well, uh, Dr. Ian Griffin, it is always a pleasure and really interesting speaking with you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, that is the advice uh, from the man in the know. If you're interested, uh, get out there, people, and enjoy uh, the, the display, the planets on display.